Christ. Amen. Back in the book of Romans chapter 12, we're, gonna, we're going today from verses 14 to verses 16. Uh, God willing, uh, next week we'll end uh, Romans 12, and then we are going to have a series on uh, Reformation. Um, not on Reformation, historical Reformation, in God's Word that will lead us to understand and to um, uh, bring it to our hearts more what does the reform mean. Um, I don't think so. So uh, um, we have uh, Romans 12, verse 14 to 16. Today we're going to talk about precepts of Christian life. We have been uh, in the book of, on, on, on this chapter 12 uh, for multiple times going back and forth on, uh, on how to live and how we apply the doctrines of grace to our lives. And we uh, start by learning that we, have, we cannot accommodate to the world, to the thinking of the world. We have to need our minds to be renewed. And then we spoke about not being much of ourselves, right? In chapter 3, uh, verse 3, and that was the second message on, a, on, the, on, the, on Romans 12. And then last week we were talking about how we depend on one another. Right. Oh, actually, we talk about how to depend on one another, and then we we talk about the love. Right, the love, the Christian love. That's the way it we went. Uh, today we're gonna um, uh, from verses fourteen to sixteen is a very simple uh, te test uh, text. Uh, you'll see that is multiple things that we should do and how we should act uh, as Christians. And again, salvation is by grace and grace alone and Christ and Christ alone. He saved you. He's the one working you. He's the one who perfect you. For the glory of the Father is the one who sanctifies you, but there's a lot of things that you should put in place in your life. So again, the sovereignty of God and salvation, or even in lead us to holiness, it will not invalidate it, the human resp responsibility. We have responsible we have responsibilities as, as Christians, we have responsibilities that we do should do and we should correct ourselves. All this depending on the Holy Spirit and asking the Lord to work in our lives and lead us. To do what's right, even when it sounds so difficult. And there are things, there are moments in your Christian life that you find it impossible, not difficult. You find them impossible. And I'm glad you find them impossible. I find them impossible myself. And that's when we go to the Lord because we have no, way, no other way, nothing else we can do. Right? And that leads us to be humble before the Lord and don't think much of ourselves, as we learn on the second, on verse 3, second message on this chapter. Please open your Bible in Romans 12, verse 14 to 16. If you can, please stand. We're going to read the Word of God together. It says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. But be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Let's pray. Father, we come before thee in the name of Jesus and we ask you, Lord, and you help us to understand thy word. May thy word be abundant in our life and so clear to us that we will change. And we may not leave the way we came, but we may leave this place in courage and be... Uh, willing to do thy will we ask you in jesus name amen you may be seated you may have noticed and i hope you did and if you did not please i ask you please this afternoon go back to the devotions for the last three days and you may, may have you will notice if you didn't you will notice that we had verse 14 and that was the devotional on uh, friday and we were just on verse 14 on friday Verse 15 was the devotional yesterday. Again, if you didn't read that, I ask you, please, I plead with you that you do it today. And verse 16 is the devotional for today. And we split these three verses because it's so much to do on these three verses. And it looks like for a little bit that it, Paul is all over the place. Looks like he's talking about multiple things. But if you notice, he's not talking about multiple things. He's talking about how to live a Christian life and what is expected or what God expects from you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And I, back in the day, somebody asked to one of those old preachers if um, the church would be more faithful to the Lord if the, the persecution was bigger. And he said this. 
If the church was more faithful, it would be more persecution. And let me tell you the reason why you're not persecuted so much today is because we're not so faithful as we should be. If we really remain on the commandments and stop finding excuses for our uh, uh, for the things that we don't do, trust me, persecution will be bigger. But we still experience some persecution, and not it's not because we are in the United States that we are a part of it. There is so many things that if you do, and I know you've even experienced that people that start don't like you, they know they avoid you, they don't want to talk to you, and you will experience harder things. People really trying to destroy you because of the name of Jesus. People not only want to shut you down, they don't want to hear you. They don't want you to talk even to other people. Accusations against the people of God are so many. They, uh, they use God's words to accuse us. They find multiple ways. I was talking to um, um recently to people at work and I have explaining how I cannot agree with abortion, how I cannot agree with homosexuality and so many other issues than today are approved by society and we are supposed to be the ones, we the Christians, are supposed to be the ones that are stopping things from getting better. Did you notice that? You defend God's word, the one that creates all things and you are the one that is stopping the world from being a better world. Because you and your ideas from uh, back of the days that are so, so back then that you don't understand things are getting better and you are stopping them. And that's not true. You know things are not getting better. The world is not going to a better place. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. And I have to explain. And they come up with a, this idea. What about if we go like back in the days that we put people on the, on the furnace and, and, and keep, toss, uh, toss them on the fire for they disagree? Uh, accusing the Christians to do from doing that, and we know in some cases that actually happened. And we say, we say, and I said, uh, well, we're not against people; we're against sin. And I want you to, I want to ask you, please, when you are uh, talking freely, freely, freely against sin, do not talk freely against people. We are not chasing sinners. We are chasing sin. We are against sin, not sinners. Because you are a sinner. I am a sinner. So what do we do to the ones that persecute us that are trying to find ways for us to say what's wrong or saying what's right and be accused and be uh, pointed out as the ones that are extreme and uh, you have this, oh, we can't stand people like you. you, you you're the reason why there is the problems. What do we do to those people? The people that actually persecute you. And this happens all the way. Like, it used to be a problem for the young generations in schools. And you have a few here that go into school on this modern age that is so against God. Not everybody is on a, is on a Christian school, a Christian uh, uh, environment. And even on Christian environments, so many are so not Christians. People in, like you have young people in this church in college now, this year, and we have uh, since last year, right? And how you do that? And used to, that, was, that used to be the, the environments that causes the most problems because there will be these professors and this, these people that are against Christianity and they will accuse God from things and Christians from doing things wrong. But now he's in your workplace. Now he's on the supermarket that you go. Now he's all over the place. And you stand against a generation that is doing everything wrong and against God. And I remember so much of Psalm 2 that says the, the nations of the world, they revenge against the Lord. Psalm 2 has been doing a great impact in my life on the last couple of weeks since I was called to preach on Psalm 2, which I preach here as well. And um, this week, we had in, a, the, in our kids' school the back to school, uh, back school night, and on the gathering of the parents and the word they gave us, they sung, they sing one of the psalms. That's what they do. They do the psalter, and guess what? It was Psalm two. And I, my heart filled of joy, but on the same time, it's filled of fear, 
because the wrath of God is coming. But how we deal with this, this, this is the thing that we as a Christians have to be careful of. How we deal with a generation that is a, a, about to get God's wrath upon them. And on the other hand, we know the mercies of God are so great and so wonderful. And we know also that we as sinners deserve God's wrath. But by grace and grace alone and Christ alone as we sing today, we will not get it. How, so how we deal with those people? People that will persecute you if they can. They will murder you if they can. They will hate you for what you believe. How you do that? And the word of God says that on verse 14, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Because sometimes you feel like you want to, God to do something. They are, they are blaspheming against the word, against God. Against, against God. They want to shut down the churches. They want to quiet us down. So we feel like, God, can you please? Do something about send fire from heaven and consume them all. Remember the disciples said that? Remember what Jesus answered? You don't understand which spirit are you from. You don't understand the spirit. The word of God says for us to bless them. What that means? How can you bless them? Pray for them and tell them about Jesus Christ, the greatest blessing of all. Tell to the ones that are persecuting you, that are turning against God, condemning their sins, never agreeing with the sin. And I've been very clear on my workplace about that because things are getting very complicated and they want to know what I'm going to say. And I feel that pressure a lot of times, trust me. In conversations, the whole, whole, whole way conversations, I feel that pressure so much, so much, especially now. Uh, people start confusing politics and, 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 and all these things with Christianity. And we got to make these divisions and make it clear. And I am saying very clear, I will never approve homosexuality. I will never approve abortion. I will never approve. I will not approve any kind of sin. But I said I will not also do not approve lying as a sin. The same sin. But I will never go against people. Because I want people to repent and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we preach the gospel to everyone. That's why for the ones who persecute us, we tell them about Jesus. Because we deserve the same kind of condemnation. And by mercy, someone told us about Jesus Christ. Because most of you that are sitting here in this room, if you are over 40, you not even was raised on a Christian, life, on a Christian home, did you? Most of us were not. And some, uh, some others that are over 40, maybe you were on a Christian, uh, uh, or you, was, you, you, you experienced your parents coming to the Lord. And some of you, with the either, even that is not like 30, 20, you, you, you know that. You saw your parents coming to the Lord. So you did not raise on, you, not a, a lot of you in this room that were the, like you born on a Christian home. It's not many of you. So we came because somebody told you, told your parents about Jesus Christ while you and your parents were enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Am I right? You were an enemy of the, the Lord Almighty? You were doing things against God? And somebody came to you and told you about Jesus Christ. So that's what we have to do to the others. I find that interesting that one of the accusations against the Reformed faith is this. Well, you don't need to evangelize because God's going to save whatever. Whoever it is that determines they're going to be saved, so you don't need to evangelize. I, I got that all the time. People say that about us. Why do we evangelize if people are going to say who they, we call to salvation? Let, let, let them be. And the answer for that is obvious that we do it for God's glory because everything that we do is for the glory of God. And God is glorified every time the gospel is preached. So that's the, the main th reason why we preach the gospel. We preach it because of God. If God is glorifying heaven for us to repeat the message of the gospel, well, has to repeat it every time. And the second thing is that God determined that the church, by the preaching of the gospel, by doing the Great Commission, by going out and preaching the gospel, God will use that message. And the Holy Spirit will light up minds and bring them to repentance. So we preach the gospel. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we tell everybody about Jesus Christ. That's why we tell for the person that want to shut us down about Jesus Christ. We tell them about the gospel. We tell them. We give them the blessing of the gospel. We preach the gospel to them. And every time I have an opportunity, I ask the Lord to help me to don't lose this opportunity because sometimes we do. But 
a lot of times it's just, you know, and I feel, I, I, I get this feeling. People run like, like, I remember a friend one time, he said this to me. I don't think I should ask this, but, and he asked me a question about the gospel. And I started, right? You know, like, please don't, you know. You just put gasoline on my fire. <laughs> you know, you're going to burn. And I just started going. And to a point, I looked at his face. He's so annoyed because I was keep on going. And I said, you re regret already, right? Go, yeah. Of course. We have to tell people. They want to confuse us, so we tell them about the truth. We tell them about God. So please, where you, wherever you are, Bless that people that are turning against you by turning against the gospel that you preach. And don't tell me you don't have that experience. I will not believe you. I will not believe you that you live a Christian life according to God's will. And you will not have people mocking you, not happy with what you're saying, diminishing you, or even walk away from you because they know they're going to hear the same thing again. Preach the gospel. Bless them. With the blessing, the greatest blessing that you have, which is your salvation. Do not curse them. They are already cursed. They are under condemnation. And uh, until the Holy Spirit brings them to light, they will remain cursed. And you have the word of salvation. Not your words, the word that dwells in you. How wonderful that is. I t I've been telling this over and over again. I've been seeing this. I've been seeing this in my life. Sometimes we do not understand what is dwelling in us. We don't understand. We just think it's one thing that we know. It's one thing that we do. No, no, no. The supernatural power of God is in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He leads you to live a holy life for the glory of the Father. And the people out there, they will see it. Some of them, they can't stand you because of what's in you. And some others will come to you and say, tell me more about your Jesus. Because I need that. I don't think the church understands this enough. I don't think I understand that enough. I think I need more of that. We're expecting great things to happen. Some loud voice, I don't know. No, it's already in you. It's already in you. Is already in me. He dwells in the church. The Holy Spirit came. That's why we understand that we were baptized in one spirit. The Holy Spirit came through, uh, down to the church on the day of Pentecost and remained. He never left. He's in us. And for every person that comes to the gospel receives the same spirit. The spirit of God. We're searching this and that. He's looking for things and, and he's already in us. It's hard for us to put in words on the way that we can understand. It, but it's a, a, it's, it's, it's a supernatural power. Do you understand it's a supernatural power of God? That works in you. Oh, brothers. Yes, we will be persecuted. Things will go worse. Some people th th say, well, I, I don't need that. On a Sunday morning, I go to church to feel good. You are, you are in the wrong place. You're here, you're, here, you're going to hear the truth. Things are not going to get better. We understand things are going to get better when you go to heaven, when God calls you to his presence, or Jesus comes. Things are going to get worse, brothers and sisters. Things are getting so bad, so terribly bad. We make laws today to when we should kill babies. What? What? He's no longer... If we should or not, is when? 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 Or many weeks? Brothers. And the church of Jesus Christ needs to stand against and say, no, that's a sin. We want the sinner, the person to do that, to come to repentance, to believe in Jesus Christ, to be saved. Even the persons they make those laws. We're not against them. We are against, we are against what they say. We want people to repent, to people to come to the Lord. Brothers, things are going to get bad. Seriously bad. And you say, well, I don't need that today. I'm already down enough. Hey, brother and sister, reality. We need to wake up. Wake up. Church, wake up, please. 
we are living terrible times. But the one that dwells in us is by far more powerful and the gates of hell will not stand against the church of Jesus Christ. And that's where my faith is. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm waiting for his return. I want to be found fighting against sin, against the evil one. In the second part, and that was the first verse. So the first one is, bless those who persecute you. And you don't have to search much to who persecute you. They will come to you. Bless them. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, that sounds easy. And mourn with those who mourn. That sounds easy too, right? Not very difficult. You read about this on, on yesterday? If you didn't, again, please go back and read it. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Let me tell you, it's not hard for you to mourn with the people that mourn, but it's very hard for us to rejoice with people that rejoice. And don't, don't fool yourself. It's impossible for you to don't go to a funeral. And even if you don't have a great relationship with the person that just passed or with the family. It, it is on an on on environment of mourning and everybody's sad and you will, it's two things that's going to happen there. Even if you never lost a person that you really love, you know one day it will happen and on a way you feel like some compassion and you feel some, some something in you or the other reason is one day you will die and you know that. You know you will die. And because of those two things, you will feel some compassion. You will, you will mourn. It's not, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult for you to mourn with a person that is very sick. Because you know it could be you, and you know people that get sick, and it's so terrible. And in some stages of life, it's so difficult. So you mourn with those people. And let me tell you, do that. Do that. Feel compassion. Feel compassion. I truly know. I truly believe. And we know it by scriptures that God allows things to happen to us to keep us humble. Difficulties, am I right? Sometimes you feel too much about yourself and then something happened and you go like, well, yeah, I'm not so special. I got to calm down. I got to bring it down. Sometimes you get sick for that, right? I truly believe that a Christian a lot of times are sick for that because of that. I believe that, truly. And it doesn't mean everything that you, 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 you like for next time you sneeze, you go like, oh, yeah, I was being too proud and now I'm sneezing. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. But there are things that come to all your life. You know, it keeps you, brings you down. After all, fasting is all about that, isn't it? You don't eat, so you get weak. So you pray. You come more before the Lord on a more humble spirit. It's not to boast about how many hours you can do it. It's about you being in the presence of the Lord with a humble spirit. So mourning with ones who mourn, that, that's possible. You know what's hard? is rejoice with somebody that rejoices. That's hard. And somebody shows up with a new car, and you go like, hmm that came from i wonder who's paying for it how do you afford a new car huh? you start questioning things in your mind or a, a new job what do you do to get that promotion a job a, a, a work something is wrong i never saw, saw that person so well and you start having these thoughts and you think oh it never happened to me oh come on please since you were on first grade that's that's the way it goes you got a C and the person next to you got an A plus? Like, man, I'm sure he cheats. Isn't it? it? It is true? It is true. We have such a hard time to rejoice. People who rejoice because we are so proud of everything and we want to, we're so self-centered. Brothers and sisters, rejoice with people that rejoice and believe, believe it or not, I haven't seen that in church. And somebody start being used by God or start being leading some department and doing great things. And there's always someone that will come around and say like, mm, I don't trust that. And then is there those, I even hear, hear that years ago. Oh, that was, those are the pastor's pets. I don't know what that means. The, 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 the pastor's friends, like the, the, so. Of course, the pastors only see them, they're little, little close friends. Let me tell on a church of this size, I think everybody's a pastor's friend, right? Because, I mean, like, come on. But I get that, and the church was even smaller. Like, uh, oh, yeah, those are the ones that always do the pastor. 
the pastor's friends, pastor, pastor have some favorite people in church. I do have one that is my favorite person in this church. It's so, she's so special to me. This is my, <laughs> right? <laughs> you saw Lily pointing? <laughs> That's my wife. Of course. But people start like, you know, and it's, brothers, don't, don't do that. If somebody's been used by God, just rejoice with that person. Just be happy about it. Somebody shows up in the new car. My only concern is the old wheel drive so they can come to church when it snows. That's my concern. Please buy all wheel drives. <laughs> and lately, it looks like most of the, <laughs> the brothers and si sisters did that, right? They got all wheel drives now. That's good. I like it. When it snows, everybody's in church. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's how it goes. We rejoice. It's so good. You bought a house. Great. God bless him. Use it for God's glory. Open the doors of your house. You got a new apartment, open the doors of your house and invite people to hear the gospel from you. Such a blessing. So good. You know to do something, just do it for the glory of God. Are you doing good in life? Amen. Praise the Lord with that. Be happy. Did somebody in church really make a difference? Encourage that person. Don't talk on the back. Go to them and say, listen, may God bless you. How can I help you to succeed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and succeed in the ministry? That's how it should go. I remember years ago, I, we went on a, on a conference on, on, on this church. And, then, and they had, um, and nothing wrong with what I'm going to say. I'm not critici uh, criticized. I think it was a good idea. They had uh, pictures of the, the people that the, the people that had the birthdays on that. Uh, and that's maybe an idea for Judy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pictures of the people that were doing birthdays on a wall, right? And I walk in the church, and that wall was so big. And there were so many pictures. And there was the people who do birthdays on that month. I told them, there's more people in your church having birthday in this month than the members that we have. <laughs> and you break the ice right there, right? It doesn't matter. You know, what do I want is that to be a faithful church and preach the gospel. And a lot of people come to believe in Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, if we do a wall like that in the month of July, <laughs> that will be amazing, right? We'll feel in quarters in the month of July, and then it comes the months like September. It's only two, right? <laughs> but praise the Lord for that. Rejoy with the ones that rejoy. Don't, don't just feel like hopeless because somebody's doing well. Just rejoy in that. It's a time for us to be thankful. Be thankful to the Lord. And on verse 16 says, live in harmony with one another. And we learn about this just when we spoke about the members of the body. Let's live together. Let's do this fellowship longer. Well, you can't. You have to church at 12 o'clock. But let's make it more times. To do wonderful things together. And be with one another. Call one another. Rejoice. Do not be proud. You say, well, I'm not proud. Let me tell you, brothers, it's so easy for us to be proud. It's so easy. Somebody does, did a compliment and you feel already proud. I say, oh, I'm not like that. Let me tell you, brothers, it's, it's there somehow. And it will come out one day. If you don't be humble before the Lord. If you don't work on that every day of your life. It will come out sometime. When you less expect. Because there was the that, that's always related to any kind of sin that you start feeling proud. And it's today, it's so terrible that people call sin as a good thing, as a pride movement. Brothers, that's how it's so easy for us. May God help us. Even when we say, I'm so proud of you about something. And this is nothing with a bad intent. I know you don't say that as a bad intent, but we have to be very careful, very careful with that proud. We are easy to be proud. And then he says, be willing to associate with people of low position. Understand, there will be people with low position, whatever you are. There will be. You will always be people that are on different places. And we tend to look things horizontal. And we always try to find somebody doing wrong for us to feel better. At least I'm not like that person. Remember from the Bible? Remember the Pharisee? And the tax collector? Oh, Lord, I'm so bad. He was praying about it. He was praying about it. 
I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that, that I'm not like him. He was praying about that on the parable that Jesus told. No, just understand that uh, you are also a sinner. So when you are out there, be com have compassion with people. Sit down with the person that is uh, out on an inferior position and will be on the totally inferior position before you. Is the person that, has no, that doesn't have Christ. Sit down with them, tell them about the Lord of, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you are with people that have already the Lord, and, and if he's one that is that feels like he's on an inferior or a low position, is the person that you should bring it in and you should talk to that person. And don't consider yourself superior. You are not. We are not. We are not that important. We are not important at all. It is so good to come to church to hear that you are not important, right? I'm not important. We are not important. We're not so special. We're not. It's nothing special about us. It is Jesus who is special. He is the one, is the Lord, is the King. And we are nothing. We're nothing to be proud of. Don't, don't, don't think too much about yourself. Don't just keep yourself humble in the opposite of proud. I want to go to the text that we that we start this service. Please allow me to go to Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. If you can, open your Bible. If you're not, just please pay attention. You don't need to stand. Philipp Philippians 2, 5 to 8. It tells us about this and gives us Jesus Christ as the greatest and the biggest example of all on that. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Hey, let's stop here before we go any further. You think you can do that? In our relationships, right? In our relationships. You know, with, 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 with first always the brothers in Christ and then with people in our workplaces, in, in whatever we are, in our neighborhood. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It's not like Paul. And they'll be hard. It's like Jesus Christ. Just, just be like Jesus. Think what Jesus think, and we have, we are going to sing about that, right? It's a song that we sing. I think in, I don't know if in English, when in Portuguese, we say, "Give me a heart like the heart of Jesus." Like a heart like Jesus, our greatest example. And a lot of people think, "Wow, wait, that's exactly what I should do. I should be like Jesus." And there was even a movie, right? What What will Jesus do? Remember, remember the movie. What will Jesus do? Right. And a lot of people think this way. Well, I have to be like Jesus means I have to, whatever Jesus was doing in this situation that I'm dealing with, that, that I have to do that, right? A, a lot of things that you deal with, you will not have to deal with if you have been acting like Jesus before. Do you notice that? Don't be deceived. There was even, there's all over the place. Remember WWJD? What will Jesus do? And you have a bracelet? With, with that? Did they have that back in the what well, the 90s? The, some of you, right? You remember that? It was a little, I, I remember we had a little car, right? That was yours, yeah. What will Jesus do? And the main idea is this, on this situation that is happening right now, what will Jesus do? It's based on this, have the same mind, the mindset of Jesus Christ. So how will we deal with that? Forgetting that a lot of times, um, it's nothing wrong with the thought. Let me put it this way. If you have one of those bracelets, whatever, I, I'm not, don't toss it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, a lot of times, you did not have to ask that question on that situation if you had done what Jesus will do before. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you are, a lot of times, in a situation that Jesus will not be, so you don't have that example because Jesus will never been there. Jesus will never repent from sin. So start with that. Don't sin against the Lord. What about that? It goes deeper down. So what is the text considering here? What is going on here? Who, verse 6, being in very nature God. Jesus, being in very nature God, being God himself. did not considered equally with God something to be used to his own advantage. By being God, he did not consider that in his own advantage. And this is what he did. He rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And this is what he did. 
He came down because he could not get to him. And that's, what the, that's the mindset of Jesus Christ. It must be in our minds every time, all the time. When you deal in church with one another, when you are in your relationships or work with your friends or whatever, your family, whatever it is, when you are out to the door, including the ones that persecute you. Romans 12, 14, the verse, verse from the text today. Even for those who persecute you or the people that are in lower position or whoever it is. The people that are mourning or the people that are rejoicing with everyone, with everyone at all the time have the same mindset of Jesus Christ with his very nature, being God himself. He considered himself as that will not be its goal at the time and he came down as a servant. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, as that was not enough, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to dead, even dead on the cross. Now that's hard. That's hard. This is totally different than what we spoke last week in the Sunday school, if you were in the Sunday school last week, that we said that Jesus paid taxes. So when you pay taxes, you say what Jesus did, right? And Jesus said to pay taxes, didn't he? And he also told to Peter to go fish, and then, right, and he did that. And so that's what we say when we say, what will Jesus do, right? But the mindset of Christ is, goes it's there further. It's not only that. It goes further from that. It's a lot more. It's being like him means I will lay down my life. I will consider it as nothing to serve the others for the benefit of the others. And that's what he did. But we are nothing in ourselves. We're nothing. We're sinners. We deserve condemnation. He is God himself. And here comes the difference between religion and Christianity. And you know this already because we've been saying this over and over again. Any religions will try to, try to reconnect you, to, to connect you with God because they understand there is some brokenness. So any deity, that's what they do. They try to reconnect you with God by doing something because they understand there's some, some, something broke in the middle time. You, in the meantime, you know it's sin. You know it's the fall. But the difference between Christianity and any other religion is this, that we don't try to reconnect with God. And I think that was the Sunday school today for the, for the little ones. They were building a tower, right? They're building a tower, right? They try, that was based on the uh, Babel Tower, they try to connect with God. And that's what religions try to do, to try to connect with God. But because we couldn't, because we fell short, but by far we can't connect with God, Christ came down. That's Christianity. That's why we call it the way. Jesus is the way. The way to God. He came down because we couldn't get to him. Nothing that we could have done. So he came. As a servant. The owner, creator of the universe. He came as a servant. It's not like when your, bo your boss or work comes around and does your job and shows you what to do and maybe gives you a hand. No, it's not that. It's the creator of the universe, the owner of all, the one that was offended by your sins. He came down as a servant and he gave himself away. He took upon him the wrath of God that was to be upon you because of your sins to give you salvation. That's what he did. That's what the cross is. So... Have the mindset of Christ. It's so deep, profound. And we take it so lightly, right? Oh, I just have to think what Jesus will do here. Hey, should I, should I drive my car 50 miles an hour? Well, Jesus will drive. No, no, it's a lot more than that, brothers. That, that's a good thought. I don't think Jesus will drive. He didn't drove back then. So, well, there's no cars there. I know that. I don't know. Jesus will drive today. But that's not the point here. It's not how Jesus will drive the car. 
It's what his mindset was, what he was focused on. He was obedient to the Father. He came to give his life. You could not live a perfect life. Do you understand why Jesus didn't came and just die on a cross and went back to heaven? He had actually to live here. Because your justification is not only on his death and resurrection, it's also on his life. We, we, we just get the life of Christ as the miracles and the teaching, and that was great. Now, examples of life. No, no, it's more than that. He fulfilled what, where you failed. He lived the perfect life because you couldn't live. But every time you fail, you fail, Christ lived for you the perfect life. This is wonderful. This is the complete gospel. We skip parts. We tend to skip parts. We just go from the, the birth of Christ. We're going to be celebrating in a couple of months when snow comes down. And we will be celebrating, right? In a couple of months, we're going to be like, oh, all about Christmas. Jesus born. And then we jump to Easter, right? There, and then he died. And sometimes we almost skip resurrection. Because we focus so much on the death of Christ. The whole life and ministry of Christ is important. The way he born, the way he lived, the way he died, and the way he resurrect, and he's king and lord, and he's lived today. And because he lives, we even sing, I can face tomorrow. So that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not only his, his death, he's how he lived. And above all, how he resurrect himself from the dead. Oh, he gave his life away. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and death on a cross. Brothers and sisters, we start this text today, the precepts of a Christian life, talking about the ones that persecute you, that you have been called to bless them, you were to rejoice to the ones who rejoice and cry to the ones who cry. And also, you shouldn't be proud. You should be, um, you should be willing to associate with people of low position, all of that. But let me tell you, we got to end this all in Jesus Christ. Because you cannot do any of this. And I just hope you leave, if you leave this room today, understanding that you cannot do any of these three points, that isn't these three Bible verses, I'll be so happy. If you understand you can't do this, I'll be so happy because that will lead you to go home and pray and pray more and more and more until the Holy Spirit leads you to, to, co to completely not only accept but actually do those precepts of a Christian life. Jesus Christ complete on the cross, on his ministry, on his resurrection and gave you the possibility for you to look to this text and say, I cannot, but I know that I will do because God will do in me. Ask the Lord for this. And again, you don't do this to be saved. You don't have to do this to be saved. But if you are saved, you will not, you will not ignore this message. You will not just go home and have a, a good time and just forget about this. You will pray about it. You will ask the Lord to help you. To live a life that glorifies the Father, a life that pleases to Him, a life that comes according to what He wants you to live. Brothers, we are living really bad times, as I told you before. I'm not optimist about this world. I'm not. But I'm truly optimist about what Jesus Christ did and to His kingdom. And I know that God will use us as the church. To show the world that is a true, that is a Lord, that is a King, and that we are His people. And nothing will stop the gospel to be proclaimed and to be announced. Do this commitment with the Lord today. Go to Him in prayer. Read the devotionals again if you read them or if you didn't, just please do it. And ask the Lord to work each part of that in your life. Remembering that you need to be like Jesus. And you will work that in your life. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before thee in the name of Jesus. And we understand, Lord, that we need a lot more. We need to be like Jesus Christ. 
And Father, Father, as hard as it is, we know that you are the one who will lead us to live a life that glorifies and that shows Christ to the world. Help us, Lord, to bless the one that persecutes us. Help us, Lord, to rejoice with the ones that rejoice while we mourn with the ones who mourn. Help us, Lord, to have the mindset that was in Christ Jesus, that he humbles himself and was obedient to the, mo- to the dead and dead on a cross. Help us, Lord, to understand this. And may we live this way. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I'll say, Amen. You may be seated.